know how many of you saw the delegation that came in from Denver yesterday. We brought around 250 people from Denver that we staged what you might call a mini walk from Denver into Pueblo here. And it was kind of an interesting thing. Vernon Belcourt and myself came into Denver over the weekend, last weekend, and we started talking about the legislation. We started talking about ways to combat it. And the people in Denver had a tremendous interest in this stuff. The only nobody was, for some reason, they weren't mobilizing behind one single group or what. Anyway, after we started talking about it, they arranged a meeting in the Denver Indian Center last Wednesday. We had a pretty good turnout, and we asked them if they'd be interested in staging a walk from Denver into Pueblo. And everybody agreed on this. And so we set it up for the Thursday, which we left last, last Thursday. And we had a tremendous outpouring of people, Indians and non-Indians alike. And from our Chicano brothers, they poured out in mass. And we walked in yesterday and saw the people were here and the unity and so forth. It gives you a tremendous feeling. You know, a lot of people are still not fully aware of why this legislation has been introduced. We still have people asking, why have they introduced this legislation against Indian people? And maybe I can help explain why this legislation has been introduced. You all know that they have been, they've introduced 11 different pieces of legislation. And this is called anti-Indian legislation. And you're fully familiar with some of these, but the most insidious and probably the worst bill of the lot is called House Resolution 9054. And I'm sure you've had many people tell you about this bill. But when you take the combination of House Resolution 9054, which is called the Native American Equal Opportunity Act, this man had introduced it. His name is Jack Cunningham. People have never really found out why he suddenly became anti-Indian, why he decided to issue such a bill, establish it. Jack Cunningham was given $175,000 for his re-election campaign. He was given this money by the Interstate Congress for Equal Rights and Responsibilities. Now, I might further explain there are five national organizations that are sponsoring and spearheading this anti-Indian legislation. One of these groups is called Trout Unlimited. Another one is called the National Wildlife Federation. And another one is the International Wildlife Federation. And another one is called the Interna well, National Association of Counties. And the most powerful and probably the most vicious of the lot is called the Interstate Congress for Equal Rights and Responsibilities. This group, they're made up of people who openly state they hate Indians. They had $13 million backing them in 1977. They collect millions of dollars each year by direct mail contribution. These people have 15 lawyers working full time in Washington, D.C., lobbying against any type of legislation that is pro-Indian. They had a meeting in November in Seattle, Washington. And when they had this meeting, they had members from all over the United States. They're spread into 26 states now. And when this man came to the podium, the first thing he said was, I came here to fight Indians. These people think they're at actual war with us. They're very powerful. A lot of people take them for granted. They rent an entire complex, an office building in Washington. They have 15 lawyers working full time against any type of legislation that's pro-Indian. They meet regularly with the Department of Justice, Interior Department, and White House officials. These people lobby every day in Washington against us. They're the most powerful group in the country at this time that is spearheading this move against us. And there's another thing. They not only meet with Interior Department, Justice Department officials, and White House officials, but they're meeting with local state governors and congressmen every day. They're not to be taken lightly. And we found out that some of them belong to the Nazi party. Some of them also belong to the Minutemen. Some belong to what we call the KKK. And also most of them belong to the John Birch Society. These groups have one thing in common. They hate Indians and other minorities. 
And this is the basic reason they banded together in this diabolical group to attack Indians. And if you want to know the real reason they're after us, the Passamaquoddy and Penobscot Indians in Maine recently filed a lawsuit against the state of Maine trying to get back three quarters of the state and X millions of dollars. And the Maine officials are now sending out information to other states where they have large populations of Indians to look out, you'll be next. That they'll be trying to take my, your land away from you also through treaty, uh, or rather through lawsuits and so forth. They've given other states the jitters. What is happening is they are forming together a very powerful group of congressmen and senators and governors, as well as the Interstate Congress for Equal Rights and Responsibilities. Now, the main reason they're after our land is this, the natural resources. The land itself, as you and I know, isn't worth that much, but what's underneath it? 55% of the uranium left in the United States is on Indian land. And most of this uranium is on a Navajo reservation. And it's a very interesting thing. I was down at Shiprock about three weeks ago. They openly, they open pit mine. They have large mines there which are taking this uranium out. Once they extract the uranium, they leave the residue it's left on top of the ground. They've got some low grade uranium that's right on top of the ground. When the wind blows, it blows this radioactive dust in many different directions. The grass around these mines won't grow, the trees are stunted, and everything around there is contaminated. Well, around, uh, among many of our nations of uh, Indian people, indigenous people, natural peoples of the earth, the sacred pipe uh, was brought to us uh, in our prophecies. It was brought to us almost at the time of our creation. It's the beginning of our spiritual, uh, our spiritual life. And um, it, is, it could be compared uh, to the uh, sacred uh, sacrament of any other religion and, uh, in the sense that uh, Indian, Indian people use it in their spiritual ceremonies. Uh, they use the sacred pipe and the sacred tobaccos, the natural tobaccos of the, of the bushes and the earth, uh, of the uh, gifts of the Creator uh, in the ceremonies. And so it's... Uh, the sacred pipe is a, is a very important part of our spiritual history. It is said that when we offer the uh, pipe uh, to the four directions of the universe and to the, uh, and to the universe and to the sacred grandmother earth, it is at that time that our prayers are carried to the Great Spirit. In the language of the Anishinaabeg people, of which I am a member of the Loon clan, uh, we refer to the Creator as Manitou, other tribal people of the world refer to it in their way. So the, the sacred pipe is a very important part of our, our spiritual way of life. You're taking it to Washington? Um... Yes, uh, this, uh, this is a spiritual walk here. And um, at the uh, front of this walk, we are carrying the sacred pipe. It is a pipe that was blessed and it was uh, Prayers were offered to this pipe on Alcatraz Island in the early morning hours of February 11th. And uh, we have several young men uh, who have been selected as pipe carriers. And anyone uh, joining uh, this walk has to walk in that spirit of mutual love, respect, and peace. And uh, so this is our power. Our power is our spiritual power. And it's this spiritual way of life and our relationship and love for the Grandmother Earth and for all of her creations. And it's through this uh, spiritual power that's allowed us to survive this 489-year uh, colonial war that this government of the United States uh, and their colonial Congress has been waging on us. And so through the spiritual uh, power of the uh, sacred pipe and our traditional uh, spiritual way of life, uh, uh, in that spirit and through that power, uh, we are walking to uh, the uh, Washington, D.C., uh, not only to uh, dramatize and to focus and to defeat 11 pieces of legislation that have been introduced before the Congress uh, that would abrogate our treaties, uh, would extinguish or attempt to extinguish our sovereign rights. Uh, 
expre it's, it's an expression of the arrogance of this Congress that they could try to extinguish our sovereign rights to this uh, Mother Earth. And we believe that at the time of uh, the beginning of our history here on Turtle Island, uh, which is our, these sacred islands, which the uh, colonists refer to as North and South America, the Great Spirit Manitou imbued in the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere certain inalienable sovereign rights uh, that cannot be extinguished by anyone. Uh, no Congress of the United States, uh, no government, uh, uh, colonial government of any one of our uh, nations of Indian people in North or South America uh, can extinguish those rights. And we believe that uh, those rights imbued in the indigenous people by the Creator can only be extinguished by the Creator. So this walk is to not only to defeat this legislation, but to say up front that the United States government must honor their treaty commitments to native indigenous nations. Uh, they must respect and guarantee us uh, uh, our national homelands. They must respect the, uh, our political integrity within those national territories. We must given, be given the total right to self-determination within those lands. And uh, so this is what we're saying, that the United States government, while they uh, make treaties throughout the world, and while they say they honor their treaties throughout the world, uh, while they are putting the burden of responsibility on the Panamanian government, for instance, in regards to the canal treaties, that the same uh, reactionary, what they call the new right within the Congress, uh, would attempt to extinguish our treaty rights and our uh, treaties, which we certainly see as uh, sacred covenants, the United States government under international treaty law must see them as binding contractual agreements, binding our sovereign nations and the United States Congress to certain inviolate international relationships. It has been the violation of those treaties that have brought about a situation where uh, our lands are being ripped off, our water is being taken, our the gifts of the grandmother, Earth, uh, the resources are being um, exploited, and so we are saying that the United States government must honor those treaties. Can you cite any specific examples of how the government's been abusing, misusing the Indians? Or? Well, when the uh, treaty-making era ended in the late 1800s, our leaders reserved for us a certain sovereign rights to those lands, inalienable sovereign rights. We reserved about 150 million acres of land which sounds like a lot, but I can assure you it's very little compared to the billions of acres that we ceded to the government of the United States in consideration of those treaties. And after 100 years of mismanagement by the federal government of their trust responsibility, we have found that over 100 million acres of our land have disappeared from tribal control. Yet on the 50 million acres of land that we still control, I hate to refer to it as land, but uh, the sacred Mother Earth, we find that we've got 30% of the coal. We have 85% of the uranium, approximately. We have 3% uh, of the reserves of natural gas and oil. Uh, we have much of the timber, and even though many of the lands are arid, or much of the lands are arid, uh, we do have a lot of water. And of course, this legislation would try to extinguish our water rights also. So uh, the Department of the Interior, the United States government, who has a responsibility to implement it, the government's trust responsibility, is the same agency that leases out our land to oil companies, mining companies, agribusiness corporations. And it is through the greed of the American colonial society and its government that they continue to rip the flesh from our grandmother earth, and I refer to the strip mining. And uh, we cannot tolerate the desecration of this mother earth. We were placed here as the safe keepers of this land, not the owners. You cannot own the grandmother earth. To try to say that we could own the land is to say we can own the clouds or the air. Although, you know, this is just something we have never looked at. We look at the land in a sacred way. And it is in this way that through the spiritual walk that we want to preserve and that we want to guarantee our future generations a future in our own national homelands. I believe that through the spiritual walk, which all people of uh, spiritual ways are asked to join or involved, can join us, that we are not only advocating for the survival of our unborn generations, but perhaps we are also advocating for the survival of the unborn generations of our enemies. Fact is, uh, anyone that wants to join the walk, uh, wants information on the walk, or may want to contribute either material or financial support, can do so by 
writing to the longest walk, post office box 409, DQ University, Davis, California. And I want to thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you very much. In Germany. And then he also said, in the press, the press tells us about the new enlightened policies of the, of the, of the government concerning Jewish affairs. Welcome to Nazi Germany. We're back home in the West where they want our water, where they want our children, where they want our resources, where they want our very life as a people. The press back there, the only thing we hear from Washington, D.C. is that such and such a tribe has received X amount of hundreds of thousands of dollars for a certain program. They don't tell you that 92% of that money is, is taken up in administrative costs who call themselves, and I quote, elected tribal officials. You know, Philip Deere told the international community in Geneva what a, what a colonist means to him. Well, the Indian people have been in a process in the past 10 years of decolonizing themselves. And the neo-colonists that rule our lands in their business suits, their credit cards, their per diem payments, these colonists act just like the white man. And when Mondale, they met with Vice President Mondale yesterday, he said, well, wait a minute. All you people who were grassroots elders in that meeting with him, about 25, he says, wait a minute, I've got to deal with the National Tribal Chairman's Association, the National Congress of American Indians. He says, who am I to deal with? Well, Philip Deere, an elder of the Muscogee Nation, stood up and he said, that is for you to decide. All I'm telling you here is that there are honorable people in this room and that now you have to include us in your dealings with Indian people. And he also said that it's your own prerogative if you want to deal with drunks. So you see, the neo-colonists are just another arm of the genocide in this country that is prevalent. And you know, the United States of America, the people inside this country, have a difficult time with that word genocide. I mean, they'll point fingers all over the globe. They'll go around, send out emissaries, and point fingers about human rights. But they always forget that when you point that finger, three are pointing back. Now, you know, Nazi Germany, they began their program of genocide through legislation. People forget that. They began to legislate the Jewish people into non-persons. But I'll tell all you non-Indians here today that we are the only ethnic group in this country that has 2,000 more laws governing us than the rest of you all. Over 2,000. And they're trying to increase it. With Senate Bill 1437 and House Bill 6869. But with the German tactic, and by the way, if you've ever read any of Hitler's writings, he told you that he got his idea on how to treat the Jewish people in Nazi Germany from the American example of treatment of American Indians. That's where he got that idea. They began legislating the Jewish people out of existence. And you saw what happened. The Indian Reorganization Act of 1934, read it once, and then read South Africa's Bantu Development Act. 
Yes, until sir. 1952 that they passed a law that we could drink alcoholic beverages. It wasn't until 1969 that we got the Indian Civil Rights Act. And then the Supreme Court just has laid down a decision a couple of weeks ago that says Indian people have no civil rights on Indian reservations because they cannot sue for their civil rights against tribal officials, the neo-colonists I was telling you about. So right away, tribal officials, to protect their little ripoff, can hire goon squads who are then official tribal members. There's a napalm on our people. Where they're machine gunning them from planes. Where they just go into villages and wipe them out indiscriminately. And you see in the press, 100 in Nicaragua were killed. But an actual count, because they're working in our International Indian Treaty Council office, was a Nicaraguan who had to return home because his family was murdered. You see, with less than a half a million people, red people of the Western Hemisphere, remaining in the United States on our land base, less than half a million, and they cannot come up because of their greed and the, and the power of the multinationals with any viable policy. Instead, they're trying to legislate us out of existence. And yet the American people still have problem with the word genocide. Not this great country. That was in the past. That was in the past. My fathers did that. I'm not responsible. That's what white America is saying to us today. Well, then you go to the 42% documented 42% of our women alone who were sterilized. The GAO, at the request of Senator Abresk, uncovered 24% out of four different hospitals. We conducted a survey out of all 10 areas of HEW. 36% in, in Puerto Rico were sterilized. Half hour meeting, because that's all the time yet. He stayed there for two and a half hours after our elders, going through a lot of white tape, kept him waiting for an hour. So you have to understand the part. They call us primitive pagan savage. The winged things of the air, the four-legged, we have a conversation with them to this very day. And we know the meaning of respect. Our sacred mother who you're sitting on communicates with us. And one of the reasons why we prefer to go barefoot in our ceremonies is to become closer with our mother. To them in their own terms, the meaning of respect. And we told them, that do not think of our natural resources any longer as income. Think of it as capital. When the multinational corporations, if they can open up their eyes to see down to the road. Nazi Germany rebuilt. And Japan rebuilt. What about the less than half a million in allegedly the greatest country in the history of mankind. I'll tell you why they're afraid of us. They're afraid of us because of our religion. They're afraid of us. Mankind become to know the philosophy of the red people in the Western Hemisphere. There will no longer be a need for board chairman and trilateral commission. So that is the essence of genocide in this country. I'm not going to stand up here and document fact by fact. It is happening and it is these people form a more perfect union. And so they drafted the Constitution of the United States 13 years after the liber liberation of the aristocracy. But at any rate, about 30 percent of the Iroquois Confederacy's great law of peace 
Only 30%. And both philosophies are at each other's throat now. You know why? It's because they separated church from state. And here in Washington, D.C., again. Red, yellow, black, white. Mix those colors together, and you get the color of our sacred Mother Earth and the other color of mankind. So I'm going to tell, once again, the White House and the United States government what Chief Seattle said before he and his people went, were forced into a concentration camp in what is now the state of Washington. Because it is very appropriate and should be the watchword of the longest walk. Nation follows nation and tribe follows tribe. It's like the waves of the sea. It is the order of nature and regret is useless. Your time of decay may be distant, but it will surely come. For even the white man's God who walked and talked with him as friend with friend could not escape the common destiny. We may be brothers after all. We shall see. We talk about red power. There are many definitions to red power. Sometimes we refer to red as the blood. But all colors of men have the same color of blood. The fish life, they have blood also. The animals, they too have red blood. Everyone has red blood, but everyone was not made out of the red clay of Americas. Only the Indian people here are the original people of Americas. Our roots are planted deep in the soils of America. We are the only people that have continued with the oldest religion in this country. We are the people that still yet speaks the language that was given to us by the Creator. Our religion has survived. Our language has survived. Long before this building was built, our ancestors walked and talked the language that I talk today. And I hope to see my Indian people continue to live long after this building crumbles. I see in the future, perhaps this civilization is coming near to the end. For that reason, we have continued with the instructions of our ancestors. We are the only people that knows how to survive in this country. We have existed here for thousands and thousands of years, and the smartest man in America doesn't know and cannot date the time that we originated. This is our homeland. We came from no other country. Regardless of how many billions and billions of dollars is spent on an Indian, to make him someone else, all these billions have failed to make a white man out of me. We are the evidence of the Western Hemisphere. We still yet walk across the entire United States to come here to present to you the problems that we have. 
even though we see many sympathizers, non-Indians, who shares with us, who has feelings for us, and perhaps even feel sorry for us. But as an Indian, I feel sorry for the non-Indians. And because I can see the confusion among them. The society is confused. I can see that as a bystander. If I am with the society, I too will be confused. <laughs> In the beginning of times, when everything was created, during these times, our ancestors also came about in this part of the world. There is no Indian on these grounds here that will say that we came across Bering Straits. There is no Indian standing among us will tell you that we descended from apes and monkeys. We've always looked at ourselves as human beings. In some institutions, we are told that man descended from apes and monkeys. I sometimes believe that there are some people that descended from apes and monkeys. That's why in the past 200 years, there are some people that do not understand what an Indian is. That's how come they don't understand what these 11 bills are all about because these bills affect human beings. <clears throat> we are the original people here. No one can tell us how to live here. No one is able to direct our lives and determine the lives for us. We have forgotten in a short time that when the first people landed on our shores, they could not survive. Even the pilgrims could not survive. The Indians showed them the way of survival. We taught them how to live. We taught them how to plant corn. That corn was a tree of life for us. We showed them that this is life here in America, and they survived. Not too many years afterwards, Farm agents come to our house and try to tell us how to farm. Now, too many years afterwards, they begin to tell us how to live. They begin to tell us that our religion was wrong. Our way of life was no good. This is not the agreements that we made. This is not the treaties that we made with, with the U.S. government or any other country. We agreed that we would remain as independent nations. We would be sovereign people. It was understood that these people, the new people who were seeking freedom, can have their freedom and share the same soils here with us. We had enough room for these people because we live by an understood law. A law that we had for thousands of years. We had an unchanging government. The law of love, peace, and respect. No man-made laws will ever take the place of it. And this is a law that we've always lived by. And because of understanding this law, every Indian door was open to everyone. Through these doors walked in Christopher Columbus. Through these doors walked in the pilgrims because of that love and respect we had for all human beings. But time came after entering our door. They took advantage over the native people here. Their greed, we have seen it. Many of our people have died Many of our people were massacred because of wanting more land. We gave them land through treaties. 
We gave and we gave and we have no more to give today. Not only land was taken, even the culture, even the religion, under man-made laws were taken away from the native people. But we managed to survive. We continued with our way of life. <clears throat> the jailhouses, the prisons in this country is no more than 400 years old. Prior to the coming of Columbus, more than 400 tribes speak in different languages, having different ways, having different religions, lived here. None of these tribes had no jailhouses. They had no prison walls. They had no insane asylum. No country today can exist without them. Why? Did we not have any prisons? Why did we not have any jailhouses and insane asylums? Because we lived by an understood law. We understood what life is all about. To this day, we are not that confused. My elders, spiritual leaders, medicine men, my clan mother setting up here as you see them, we have no disagreement. We're not that confused. We come to you with one mind. I have my brothers and my sisters of different tribes here with me, but we do not disagree on Indian religion. I have never tried to convert the Lakota people into Muscogee ways. So I look out here on every corner, there is a church. One of them trying to convert the other one. But we did not come here with that kind of a confusion. We respect one another's religion. We respect one another's visions. That's our only way of existing in this country here. That's our survival. This is our strength. Even though we are greatly outnumbered, our ideas will overcome those numbers. because they have been so far away from that natural way of thinking. They have to look at a sheet of paper and get directions from the higher ups. Even their minds are controlled. They can't make decisions for themselves. They have to follow these papers and nothing real. We've seen that. We have experienced this for many, many years. We've come through this. Now, we understand that these bills that are affecting us affects the grassroots people. Not the one that's trying to be an Indian in Hollywood, but the Indian at home on reservations who are still yet out there. These bills are affecting them. And that's why this walk began. This is not the first time that the Indian people have walked so many miles. <clears throat> I am, as I said, the Muskoki tribe, known as the Creek tribe also. If you study your history, my ancestral homelands was in Georgia. I know anything about the Geneva Conference here in the United States. The press did not bring this out. Why? Documents were presented there, so damaging, and it was a disgrace to this country that the native people have to go to Geneva seeking human rights. Why does the native of America have to go to another country to seek human rights? Today, we too are interested in human rights, as well as those people in Berlin. We too are interested in human rights, as well as other countries are. How much rights has the Indian have? If we have anyone here that's a non-Indian, I want to remind you, don't look at me as if though I am most discriminated against. 
Look at yourself. My people has never discriminated against me. But I think the white man is most discriminated against because he's discriminated against by his own kind. I learned this through Watergate. <laughs> the truth. We are the believers in the truth and not in facts as society follows. We believe in the truth. Society follows facts. It can originate from lies. But if they believe it to be truth, well, it's truth to them. But we believe in the truth. So many times, you may want to know how many people I represent. I represent the truth. And I represent the future generations of my people. Oh, oh. Freedom to walk and go wherever I please. Free to be who I am. Free to bring the children into this world as I was supposed to, which means sterilization is out. Genocide must have to come to an end. This is the type of freedom that we're walking for. This is the kind of freedom that we are looking for. And this is what my brothers died for. This is why many of my brothers are in prisons today. This is why we have to have people to walk all the way across this country here seeking freedom. We have to remind ourselves that this is not only an Indian problem. That's why we have been able to get support international right. We have been getting support from the non-Indians all over because they begin to understand, they begin to realize what's happening here. It makes me wonder if the Indians can be slapped around, can be shoved around all these years, who's going to be the next Indian? A few years ago, Black people fought for what they wanted. They could see the signs on many of the states. On the doors was written, no colors allowed. We don't see that no more, because, but they had to fight for it. Today, we see another sign on there that doesn't have nothing to do with your color. And we've heard that over and over. We've seen it over and over. I'm just using it as an example. I'm not saying it's good or bad. But on that door, that no colored sign is not there. But there is a sign that says that no shirt, no shoes, no service. But instead, they only looked at who was there and what was going on there. But we still yet prove the attitudes of our oppressors. When wounded knee happened, Every military, every armed forces that you could think of, that the government had, everybody was there. National Guard, Army, and everybody was there surrounding this little bitty occupied land by a handful of Indian people. Every military forces you could think of was there except the United States Navy, and of course there was enough enough water there. <laughs> and this is what has happened in the past with our Indian people. Again, we come here to educate the American people on what's going on in this country with the native people. Time has come that we study the native people here. We dug up the bones. The bones of our ancestors were dug up. Our graves were dug up looking for the history of our ancestors. But the present day situation has not been checked into yet. The present day problems of the Indian people has not looked into yet. So it's time that American people be educated in a proper way. And that's why we are here today. 
the native people, as you see today, no matter how many of my brothers are jailed, no matter how many of them will go down into grave. You may silence me by a bullet someday. You may put me behind the bars someday. But that will not kill. And that will not jail the religion of my ancestors. The movement of the Indian people will continue to go on. We have been made indestructible. In our veins flows the blood of the original people of America. Today, the younger generation of my people stands up in pride as Indian people. No more we're going to stand around and watch these bills go by. We're not going to have none of this no more. No more are we going to stand around and see our people go down in the graves fighting for freedom. We're going to continue to march. This is not the end of the longest walk. We're going to continue to walk, walk and walk until we find freedom for all the native people. Again, I will remind you, you may not be an Indian, but you better join us. Your life is at stake. Your survival depends on this. At one time, the churches told us that there is only one way, and that's the way that we have to accept. But now I'm looking around and looking at the church, different denominations. I'm looking at their church memberships. They're declining. How come their children don't want to go to church no more? How come that businessman over here that owns his industry, how come his son doesn't want to stay home no more? He prefers to be out on the road hitchhiking. He prefers to be running around with his shirt off. What does that mean? That means the only freedom that our young people has is to walk around here barefooted because it means comfort. And nothing will take the place of being comfortable and satisfied in life. And that's what we are here for. Oh! Uh, and Mark Banks, and Vernon Belcourt, and frankly and myself, we started the wall. And we are the original people who started it, and the national coordinators. And this man here was one of the people who's been with us all the way, one of the older men. And he has got a poster here he wanted me to show you. And uh, possibly when we get on from here, those of you who want to take a closer look at it, we'll have some of them that we'll give out. Once again, his name is David Mislick Sr.